Well, hello, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for being here with us tonight. This is uh, the Kidlit Social. I'm Laura Backus, publisher of Children's Book Insider. And I'm really excited about our session tonight because we've never done this before, where we have actually um, asked our uh, Children's Book Insider subscribers uh, to send us 250 word excerpts from their works in progress. And I got a lot of great. Uh, uh, submissions when I put out the call for that uh, a couple weeks ago. And I randomly chose, literally closed my eyes, scrolled through the submissions and picked. Uh, I was going to do five, but we ended up with seven, seven submissions that I randomly chose um, that I then sent to Bonnie uh, Johnston, my, my guest tonight. And uh, she is going to do some editing demonstrations tonight on these. We are the submissions will remain anonymous. We took off all identifying information, but I really appreciate those of you who who submitted. Thank you, and those of you who were chosen, I appreciate you allowing us to show your work tonight and to uh, have some editing demonstrations. I think you're all going to learn a lot, which is which is always always great. So let me. See if I can get my slide to advance here. Okay, if you're new to us uh, and you want to get on our list so that you know about everything we do, including upcoming guests for our Kidlit socials, which are the first and third Tuesday of every month, you can go to writeforkids.org forward slash ultimate dash cheat sheet and uh, get on our mailing list, and you will also get a free ebook from us, which compiles 31 years worth of knowledge on how to get started as a children's book writer. Uh, this is our 31st year in business. And so this has our best beginner tips all in one free ebook, your gift from us. Uh, so uh, get on that list, and then we'll tell you about our, our guests coming up, as well as other great things that we are doing at Write for Kids that you might want to know about. Okay, come on. I'm using a different computer, like I said. So there we go. No, stop. Okay. And <laughs> if you are curious about our newsletter, Children's Book Insider, which was our flagship uh, product in its 31st year of publication. We have a special subscription deal for our socialites, $5 a month, writeforkids.org forward slash CBI. You get a uh, about a 20 page newsletter uh, delivered to your inbox. It's electronic every month. And you also get full access to our membership site, the CBI Clubhouse, which houses all kinds of information from our 31 years in business, uh, videos, articles, uh, replays of uh, Ask Me Anything sessions, all sorts of good stuff on there. Um, also in the issue every, every month, we have a special above the slush pile submission opportunity for either an editor or an agent. You get a special code as a CBI subscriber to submit for 30 days and your submission will be read first over the slush pile. So that's an awesome deal. So you can do that by going to that link on your screen. Now we get to celebrate. Woo! This is where we celebrate our members who do amazing things. So Roman Yasheko has announced the cover reveal for his newest picture book, Who Is It Houdini? Illustrated by Gustavo Ramos to be published by Yehu Press on February 15th, 2022. And this and his first picture book, Where the Best Stories Hide, published by BB Books in February 2020, were made possible by offers received through that very above the slush pile code that I just spoke of. Uh, he let us know that that's where he found out about this great information. And so, Roman, congratulations on that. I love both these covers, and I'm really excited to read Who Is It Houdini? It looks awesome. And also Nadine Raja wrote that, I'm excited to share with you that my first picture book, Manta Ray Dreams, is available now on Amazon in ebook and paperback. I've self-published it under my own imprint, Spiral Beats Publishing. 
and it's illustrated by Karen Ferreria's team at Get Your Book Illustrations. That's an awesome team if you are self-publishing and looking for illustrators. So she says, Manta Ray Dreams is a beautifully illustrated picture book about manta rays and magic, suitable for girls who love the ocean. And it's also a perfect bedtime story for single dads raising daughters on their own. So congratulations, Nadine. That's awesome. And that is an awesome cover. So I want to hear your good news. Send it to uh, email me at mail at writeforkids.org and put celebrate in the subject line and I will feature you on a future Kidlet Distancing so well, Kidlet Social. We used to be called the Kidlet Distancing Social and now we're just the Kidlet Social. And oh, I need to change my slide. I keep forgetting to do that. Anyway, no celebration is too small. If you found a critique group you love, let us know. If you found an agent, let us know. If you finished your first draft, we want to celebrate that with you. So send me your good news. And here's some good news that I have. We'll be talking a little bit more later about manuscript magic, but you might have heard, if you, especially if you've been on the socials before, our other site is called writingblueprints.com. And we are having a 30% off sale on everything on the site, all kinds of tools to help you write, online tools. So uh, writingblueprints.com and use the code DOGDAYS21 at checkout, the coupon code for 30% off everything. And I will show you the slide again at the end if you want to see it again. So that's what we're celebrating right Oh, until Saturday. So there you go. Okay, here's a great link of interest that I came across for you this, uh, this week. The University of Chicago Press has created an author's permission guidelines document to help authors understand if a work is still under copyright and also understand what is considered fair use and when you need to ask for permission to use all or part of the work, which is a question I get asked all the time. If you want to quote some song lyrics in your manuscript, or you want to quote from a book in print in a magazine article, how many, how much can you use without getting permission? And also, a lot of times authors are interested in using uh, an old story that might be in public domain and retell it in a new way. How do you know if it's still under copyright? And the copyright law changed in 1976. So stuff published uh, that was under copyright before then had different laws than anything after then. So it's a little confusing. This document has a really great handy dandy chart on it to help you understand all of that. So I made a direct link here bit.ly forward slash permission guidelines. I would suggest downloading this and putting it somewhere where you can refer to it often. Oh, oh, sorry, I'm <laughs> trigger happy on, on the mouse today. Now I get to bring on my guest. So Bonnie Johnson is a member of the Sterling and Stone editorial team and contributor to multiple in-house pen names with more than two decades of experience as a freelance writer and editor. And she teaches authors how to increase the emotional impact of their stories at writesmarternotharder.teachable.com or as you see here, writesmarternotharder.com. That's her, that's her main website. Go there. And you will find all sorts of great things like courses such as how to plot a series that rocks, how to write powerhouse scenes, story endings that satisfy, and you can download her free ebook, Editing for Story, lots of great stuff on there. But just as importantly, she is also the instructor for our manuscript magic tool, editing tool on our Writing Blueprint site. And in working with Bonnie to, to put together this tool about a year and a half, two years ago when it first came out, I came to realize that she is just such an amazing editor and one of the most intuitive editors I've ever met. And so I am really, really excited to have her on tonight so that you can see how she approaches the editing process. So Bonnie, 
please come on with me. Hi. Hi. I'm so glad. I'm so glad we're here and I'm on camera and you're on camera and it's all working. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Oh, great. Well, this is great. I'm I'm so excited. So before um, I bring back the slides with have with has has the excerpts on it, uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit to give us just a little bit of an overview about your approach to editing. Uh, how do you kind of when you are editing a manuscript, um, sort of where do you start? What is your step one? Hmm. Um, I like to break the editing down into three phases. Um, a story level edit, a scene level edit, and a sentence level edit. Um, the story level edit really tackles the foundation of your story, all the things that affect story structure, like for example, plot holes and timeline issues and um, scenes that don't have a purpose or things that need to be foreshadowed. Mm -hmm. Anything that would require you to take out a scene or rearrange scenes or put in new scenes, you want to tackle that all at once. <laughs> yeah. um, and then once you've done that um, and you have a solid foundation, the scene level edit lets you look at each scene in the story and make sure that it's pulling its weight. So you're looking at things like, does the scene have a, a good structure? Does it feel like a little story in itself with a beginning and a middle and an end and a strong climax where something changes for the characters? Um, you also want to look at, at um, how the scene is constructed and how you're expressing everything that happens in the action through exposition and description and dialogue, making mm -hmm. sure that each of those scene elements is actually um, the best that it can be in terms of having emotional impact and showing the reader what you want it to show. And then once your scenes are solid, then you do the sentence level edit where you're focusing on language um, and you can be really confident that you're you're actually working on the language that's going to stay in the story because you know there's no structural problems and you know that all the scenes work so then um, you can focus on you've, you've already made sure you're telling the story that you mean to tell and you've already made sure that that story is well told so at the sentence level you can make sure that you've told it beautifully mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's that's how you built our manuscript magic and we could talk about that product later, but um, the big the, the big takeaway here that that you really pounded home in manuscript magic too is doing it in this order actually saves you a lot of time because you don't end up editing things that you're then going to toss, you know, um, and have you noticed, I know in my experience when I've worked with authors and they think they have edited a manuscript. Very often what they have done is the sentence level edits, yes. because those are the <laughs> fun ones where you go through and you get to polish and pick just the right word and, and play around with the verbs and make sure it's all nice and shiny and perfect. But what they haven't done is started first at the story, the big picture, and then the scene and then the sentence. And by doing the sentence level edits first, you probably are editing stuff that you're eventually going to cut if once you actually look at the big picture. So it's not an efficient use of your editing energy. Yes. And it also saves some like emotional wear and tear on you as a writer, because if you're trying to just read the whole story and catch everything in one pass or two passes, um, it's a different kind of thinking to look at structure than it is to look at scenes and, and a different kind of thinking between sure. scenes and sentences. Mm -hmm. So if you're reading the whole thing and trying to catch everything, you're constantly switching between those three modes. And, and it's, it's very mentally wearing. And you, mm -hmm. you just get to the point where you get fatigued and then you start having trouble telling if you're making the story better or you're like, I can't tell anymore. <laughs> <laughs> right. right, because you don't even have a you don't have a solid criteria. And that's that's something that these three phases, if you can stay in that mindset of focusing on structure and catch all those problems. It's actually easier for you because you don't have to constantly switch gears. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Now, the excerpts that you're we're going to be looking at tonight, because we are seeing just a small slice of the manuscript, it's not possible to do a story level edit. Is this correct? Because you don't know what's happening in the entire story. Um, so would you say mostly what you would be looking at here is either a scene or sentence level type edits? 
Yes, exactly. Although I do think there was something in there that was a story level fix, um, because just because it was a global issue. Although to get more precise with it, I would have to read the whole story sure. to sure. give better advice. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. So, so, and I think everybody realizes that what we're doing here is just doing a very, a little, a little slice demonstration, but I think, I think it's still going to be very, very interesting uh, to see what, what Bonnie has to say. So I am going to start sharing my screen again. And, oh, there it is. Um, Okay, and now I am going to. So Bonnie, I didn't uh, go over this with you earlier, but what I thought I would do is read the excerpt out loud. So that's up on the slide. Okay. And then you can do the, start talking about what editing steps you would take. Does that sound good? That sounds great. Okay, so this is from a picture book. It was a typical day. Will was reading with Belle, snuggled up next to him. His mom was on the phone talking to his aunt and his dad was fixing a broken chair. After she finished talking with her sister, Will's mom looked at Belle and said, Will, Belle's looking a bit shaggy. Would you please brush her? Will looked at Belle and said, sure, mom, come on, Belle. Will pulled Belle's brush from the dog box and they raced each other to the front door. Will took Belle out in the front yard and started brushing and brushing and brushing. Will's mother came out to check on his progress and all she saw was a mound of hair. She thought, where is Will? And called out, Will, are you out there? Will heard his mom and replied, hi, mom, I'm out here brushing Belle. She heard Will's voice coming from the mound of hair and shouted, oh my, I can't see you because of all that hair. Can you see me? Will looked around and all he saw was hair. He wasn't sure how to get out and yelled back, mom, I don't know which way to go. It feels like I'm in a heavy fog since he wasn't sure what to do. So he just kept brushing and the mound of hair kept growing. The mail carrier was there to deliver the mail. He saw that Will's mom was upset and asked, what seems to be the problem? Okay, so um, I, uh, my first impression is just that this, this is a really fun idea for a book. Um, but Bonnie, let's, let's hear what you have to say uh, as far as what your editing suggestions are. Um, yeah, I also thought this was a really cute, whimsical premise. Um, I, I think it has a lot of potential. Um, the, the main issue that I have with it, um, and I'm going to look at some sentence level things and some scene level things, but this is the one that had the story level fix. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I'd like to address that first, just because it is the bigger issue. Um, the problem, the main problem I see with this is that the, the audience for this is a small child. Um, but Will is actually a very small part of the scene, even though he's the vehicle for the small child, he's the character that that young child is going to be identifying with. Um, and he's a passive character, which is actually, you would think that would be a scene level problem, but that is actually a story level problem. Passive characters don't make decisions that get them into trouble because those decisions have consequences. And that means you have scenes that don't pull their own weight in the story when the character is not being active and not making those decisions with consequences, which Will doesn't do. He basically does what his mother says, and then he asks her for help. Um, so the bigger picture here, I would look at this instead of we have like so much about the mom, she's talking to her sister, the dad's fixing the chair, the mailman's coming in, um, mom is trying to figure out what's going on. And we actually have very little from Will's point of view. Mm -hmm. And as this, as if I was reading this to a four-year-old, I would, <laughs> the four-year-old doesn't have a place in the scene really because Will is not active and he's not really the primary point of view character. So just looking at from it from that perspective, like when I read the first couple lines of this, I thought, and then I saw that he was brushing the dog and brushing and brushing and the hair was flying. I thought Will is going to get lost in this cloud of fog. He's going to be trying to get out. He's going to be talking to Belle. They're going to be having this adventure in the cloud of fog. Um, but he's actually not not really taking charge and making any decisions or mm -hmm. or acting in a way that 
um, would lead to the scene having um, a meaningful consequence so that there's no change at the climax. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be my global change is to like, look at this and it, I would re recommend rewriting it from Will's perspective so that we're seeing everything through his eyes and, and we're getting that sense of wonder and excitement and confusion and fear and everything that he's going through would come out on the page. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of like, because there are some scene and sentence level edits and because it would be, be informative to kind of look at some of these things, I am gonna go through them. But honestly, I would recommend this writer actually rewrite the whole scene before they change the language. <laughs> Um, in terms of fixes, um, the opening needs a lot of work, um, and that's actually would draw on several fixes that we talk about in Manuscript Magic, um, 13 and 14, and then 33 and 34, all focusing on different aspects of the scene opening. Um, the first sentence, it was a typical day. Um, that's a generic verb. Um, it's a vague pronoun. You're starting with it was, and then um, there's no imagery, there's no specifics. My typical day is different than your typical day, which will be different from all your readers' typical days. So, so really that doesn't actually tell the reader anything. Mm -hmm. um, you could completely cut that sentence. Um, the rest of the opening, the, the rest of the paragraph and the next paragraph do kind of set the scene, but it's a very static image. We don't see anyone really doing anything interesting um, or interacting with each other. Will is reading. Bell is sitting, his mom's on the phone, and his dad's fixing a chair. Um, and when you're opening a story, it is really, really important to engage your reader's interest right away and give them something to be curious about or give them some action that really kind of pulls them in. Um, so the first thing I would do, if, if we assumed that this scene was going to get rewritten, the first thing I would do is I would ask, what's something interesting that Will could be doing right at the beginning of the scene that would show us who he is, what his personality is, and also um, what his life is like without just telling us that it's a typical day. And also because um, there's a relationship with an animal here and that is so compelling for children, for all of us, but especially for children, right? So I would actually start the scene with Will and Belle interacting in some way that shows you a little bit of what their relationship is like. Um, in terms of other language fixes, um, there's some unnecessary telling. Um, Will's mother came out to check on his progress. Um, you can, when you tell us that, but then you also show her coming to check out on the progress, it's unnecessary to tell us first that that's going to happen. It's a kind of redundancy. Um, and there are some other redundancies in this. For example, uh, Will's mother thinks, where is Will? But then she asks, Will, are you out there? So her thoughts and her dialogue are saying the same thing and you don't, you don't need to double up on that. The reader will have already heard it <laughs> if you get either one or the other. Um, when he says, hi mom, I'm out here brushing Bell. Again, that's redundant because the reader has seen it and the mom knows that's where he went. Um, and that's really an opportunity to have expressed some emotion instead of just expressing some information, like to get to see what Will is feeling as he's brushing the hair and getting lost in it. Um, and then also the other thing that really stuck out was the mound of hair is mentioned twice. Um, and it's not described in a way that adds to, to our image of it mentally the second time. And also there are gonna be pictures here, right? Cause this is a picture book. So um, you really wanna make sure you're not using the words on the page to describe what's going to be in the picture. You want to make sure that the words add to what's going to be in the picture and vice versa. So again, that is a kind of redundancy that you want to watch out for um, just because you only have so many words on the page. And if you, if you waste them on describing what's in the picture, you missed out on the opportunity to have the character say something really interesting that gives you some insight into what's going on. Um, so those are my comments. And Laura, also the pacing of this, I was really interested in your thoughts on the pacing because this actually feels more like a chapter book than a picture mm -hmm. book to me. Yes, and I wanted to talk about that a little bit because when I first, I um, the author who submitted this did not tell me what, what the age group was, which I didn't ask people to. Uh, I wanted us to sort of read these 
cold without having any preconceptions about what it was. And both Bonnie and I read this and thought, oh, this is a chapter book. And then I emailed the author and said, is, are we right? And I found out, no, this was a picture book. So I'm glad because first of all, I was glad it was a picture book because there's so much visual potential here with this idea. And it's funny and it's it's all about that relationship with a pet. And it's, it's kind of um, uh, over the top silly with this boy getting stuck in this mound of hair. There's so much great... Uh, potential here for, for illustration. So I was really happy to hear that this was actually a picture book. But you're right with the pacing. It, it's, it's too wordy. It, picture books have to leave room for the pictures. Half the story is told through the pictures. So for example, if this scene was written as a picture book, and I'm just doing this off the top of my head, so don't, don't judge me, please. But <laughs> um, it might start out with, as Bonnie suggested, some action showing Will and Bell's everyday typical relationship. So Will uh, tossed the ball to Belle and she let four feet in the air to catch it. And he said, that's your biggest jump yet. Great, but that's all of our training for today. You know, something like that, that just shows this is what they do. Um, Will's mom yelled out, uh, called out, Will, while you're out in the yard, why don't you brush Belle? Belle ran in and grabbed Will ran in and grabbed Belle's brush. He, he started brushing and brushing and brushing. Will, time for lunch, mom shouted. Will, where are you? Will. And then, you know, so, so the illustrations would show that as he's brushing, the hair starts piling up. And he's covered and he's covered. And then all the text shows is that mom yells and she can't see him. Now, we want to stay in Will's point of view, as Bonnie suggested, because he is our protagonist. But he could hear mom calling him from inside the fur. So you might you might add something like that. Will heard mom calling uh, and he called back. But she didn't hear it. She just kept calling. You know, you could you could imply a lot with the text that he's buried under this mound of fur and the illustrations are going to show all of that detail. The other thing I wanted to mention is, you know, you, you need to know who your protagonist is. As Bonnie said, in a picture book, especially, it's very important that that's clear, that the, uh, the reader can identify very closely with this protagonist. And so we're following Will through the story. You want to stay in his point of view. He's got to be the one with the problem. So it has to be very clear that it's a bigger problem for him being stuck in this fur than it is for mom that she doesn't know where he is. Maybe, she, maybe he hears her say, oh, he must be in his bedroom. And then she just disappears, something like that. But he's stuck in this mound of fur, which is a funny, very illustratable picture book problem. But then think about what, what's going to happen with that. Is it going to be that no one knows he's there and he realizes that he's invisible and he can move around and people don't see him? What does he do with that new ability? Or is it that he can't get out of the fur and he's stuck? So then what is he going to do to try to get out of it? So you need to think through how this problem is going to evolve over the course of the book and how the illustration you know, how you can leave room for the illustrator to add the visual element of the story, which also adds half of the plot. So the words lay the foundation for the plot. The words might show what's going on in Will's head, his dialogue, how he feels about what's going on, but the illustrations will give all of the physical humor and will show maybe reactions to people that Will is passing on the street as he's walking around as a big mound of dog hair. Um, all of that could be happening in the pictures. And that's a, a second plot line that the readers will be picking up as they're looking at the pictures. But you don't have to mention that in the text. So this does read more like a chapter book than a picture book, because here the words are basically telling the illustrator every detail to draw. And in a picture book text, the words give the 
undrawable parts. They give the emotion, they give the internal thoughts, they give the point of view of the main character, but the, the illustrator uh, depicts all of that broad action and the, the physical description and all of that is just in the pictures. So reading a lot of picture books to get a sense of that I think is really important. And you might even read a picture book and then a chapter book together side by side that have a similar topic and really see the difference on, on how the, um, the, the two authors dealt with, with telling that story in different ways. But again, as, as Bonnie said, great illustration potential here. And so I really hope that the author continues to work on this as a picture book, because it's, it's really funny, uh, a really funny premise. And I just want to make one more quick note before we move on, Bonnie. Bonnie mentioned some numbers uh, when you were talking about manuscript magic real quick about solutions, and you said number 14, whatever. What she's referring to there is in that program, which I'll talk about at the end, um, I can't remember how many videos, numbered videos you have, Bonnie. Each one has a different, describes how to solve a different problem in your manuscript, either on the story scene or sentence level. And I want to say there's close to 50 different videos. It's been a while <laughs> since I've counted. <laughs> I think that's right. <laughs> but we'll talk at the end about how you figure out which number to use. Uh, but it's broken down into very, very specific videos that where she she explains how to solve each of these very specific problems that she's talking about. Okay, so let's go to the next one. So this is whoops, I got to move my stuff out of the way middle grade. I'm again, I, I don't remember if the author identified this as middle grade. So this was my impression on this. Stepping forward, Musa looked around the gloomy gorge. When a white cockatoo screeched, she flinched, looked behind her, took a deep breath, swallowed hard, and with small steps, cautiously walked across the gnarled log. It's so scary being chased by a masala, she thought. Reaching the other side, Musa bent and snapped hanging branches and climbed over them. She took her machete from the billum and tossed it onto the bank. As she sprang onto a large boulder, she slipped and spilled her sweet potatoes into the flood. She snatched her empty billum, caught on the rattan vines. Blood trickled down her knee. She jumped up and down, kicked the boulder, and then collapsed in a heap on the rocks. Her tears mixed with the pouring rain as she watched her sweet potatoes bobble down the river, taking her hopes of a mirror with them. She rubbed the back of her hand under her snotty nose. Her lower lip stuck out there had been no masala. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that word correctly. So, oh no, you okay? Vicky shouted from the other side of the river. I'll bring my sweet potatoes. Vicky reached into the crevasse or to the crevice, lifted her billum and looped it over her shoulder. Licking her watery lips, she pulled her dripping cap down onto her forehead, then moved forward on the log with hesitant steps. Musa saw her step back, panic stricken. Musa stood and yelled, but the wind blew her words away. She knew Vicky was bringing the sweet potatoes just for her. Okay. Um, I really enjoyed reading this passage and um, there, th this author does a lot of things right. She has a really cool setting that she brings to life with like a ton of really wonderful details. There's some great imagery in here. There's a lot of strong active verbs that make this passage feel really dynamic. You really get sucked into the action. Um, I am assuming that we're starting in the middle of the story here and that this is not an opening scene. Um, and there's a the, the first sentence, Musa are stepping forward, Musa looked around the gloomy gorge. If this was an opening sentence, the next thing I'd want to know is what she saw <laughs> before we see the white cockatoo. But because this feels like it's starting in the middle, I feel like we already probably know where we are and what things look like. Um, there is a really long sentence, the one that starts with when a cockatoo screeched. Um, it's just, there's a lot of verbs there and that sentence is really dense. I feel like that could be broken into two sentences just to make it a little bit easier for the reader to absorb. Um, the section here in the middle, it starts with reaching the other side that goes all the way down to her losing, um, or to down to blood trickle down on her knee. Um, a lot happens really quickly here, and that's great. 
but you could make the action a little bit easier to digest by breaking it up into two or three paragraphs just to give the reader a little more white space and let them absorb a couple actions and then kind of take a breath before they move on to the next paragraph. Um, but it's a very well written passage. Um, I think the biggest thing was the, the sentence at the end of that paragraph, there had been no mass lie, and I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that also. <laughs> but um, at the beginning, at the end of the first paragraph, she says it's so scary being chased by a mass lie. And then at the end of this paragraph, she says there had been no mass lie. And I have no idea how she figured that out. Like, what did she see or experience or hear that made her realize that there was nothing chasing her or that it was someone like I'm, I'm guessing that Vicky was chasing her um, and she mistook Vicky for a mass alive, but I, I'm just guessing because I don't actually know what she perceived. So that's something that I would that I would want to fix just to make me understand what the character is experiencing here. Um, there is a little unnecessary telling in Musa saw and she knew um, those those aren't necessary. You could just say Vicky stepped back panic stricken. Um, and Vicky was bringing the sweet potatoes just for her. Um, but overall, this is like a really tight passage. It's really polished. The author's prose really moves. The sentences are tight, but they're also really vivid, which mm -hmm. is hard to do. She's done a fan or he or she has done a fantastic job of using really strong verbs to keep the action going and going. Even when the character pauses, you feel like the story is moving. Um, the stakes are high. Musa and Vicky are active characters. Um, and I, I feel Musa's emotions throughout the scene. I feel how upset she is when she drops a sweet potato. And I feel how worried she is that Vicky's not going to make it across. So Laura, I would love to hear your thoughts on the scene. I, I agree with everything. I, I thought this was a very strong excerpt. Uh, because of the the words sprinkled throughout, I we know it takes place in Papua New Guinea. And Masalai, I had to look them up. Again, I couldn't find a pronunciation guide on this word, but uh, they are a type of supernatural spirit in Papua New Guinea. So that, I, I agree, this felt like it was from not the, the opening, but a little farther in on the story and the reader would already know what Masalai are from context of things that had happened earlier in the book. Um, but I like the way that there are a few uh, words of that language just sprinkled throughout, not enough to stop us. Uh, we we can, from the context, understand what they what they mean. Uh, like bilium is a like a bag uh, that they used to carry women used to carry things in, um, and it, it gives a sense of the culture and the the setting without. Uh, being too confusing for the reader. So I thought that was nicely handled. Um, but yes, I agree. I really wanted to read more of this, this story and, and it, it was very intriguing. And I, I thought I liked the sort of uh, the, the magical, you know, myth, mythical elements mixed in with what seems like a very real story. And I wanted to see where it was going. So that's great. Okay. Okay, this is a rhyming picture book and this excerpt actually goes two slides because the rhyme takes up so much room even though it's the same length, uh, it's only 250 words. So let me just read this. And I'm not gonna read the art notes but you will see them on the screen here, which were part of the manuscript. I slip into my brand new shoes and skid across the floor. Wee! Mom sees me slide, her eyes grow wide. Don't scratch, don't scuff, don't muss. Such a fuss for shoes. Oh, some slimy goo. My shoes sprout gooey fangs. I growl and howl, I snap and snarl. My monster steps are large, but what mom said pops in my head. Don't scratch, don't scuff, don't muss. Such a fuss for shoes. Yikes, a lunging lizard. My shoes grow curvy claws. I stomp and tromp, I swing and sway. My T-Rex steps are bold, but what mom said pops in my head. Don't scratch, don't scuff, don't muss. Such a fuss for shoes. Eek, a sneaky squeak. My shoes flash super beams. 
I fling and spring, I flip and flip. My hero steps are swift, but what mom said pops in my head. Don't scratch, don't scuff, don't muss. Such a fuss for shoes. Gee, a speeding streak. My shoes blink red and blue. I zip and zoom, I rock and reel. My rocket steps are swift, but what mom said pops in my head. Don't scratch, don't scuff, don't muss. Such a fuss for shoes. Whoa, a flying fowl. My shoes grow hungry beaks. I plunge and lunge. I dip and dive. My eagle steps are fierce. But what mom said pops in my head. Don't scratch, don't scuff, don't muss. Such a fuss for shoes. Oh no, a muddied mess. Mom sees me slip, she bites her lip. And that's the end of the excerpt. So let me know, Bonnie, if you want me to go back to the first slide. Okay, that would be great. Um, I really, I really enjoyed reading this. And this has been such a fun mix too of ex excerpts. I love how different they have been mm -hmm. from each other. Um, I love the concept of child's shoes being this outlet for their imagination. Like it's such a, a mundane object and you're turning it into just like all these amazing things um the mm. monsters of dinosaurs superheroes eagle, eagles rockets um and I, I can just kind of imagine the illustrations and like i could i would love love to give this book to my nephew it's so much fun um in terms of of the opening i did it did snag me up a little um because the opening has a very different um, rhythm and meter than all the other stanzas. And usually when you're presenting something as a poem, um, you're setting that expectation of like, the reader reads the first stanza and they're like, okay, I have the rhythm of this, I have the flow of this. Um, and had just having pity on the poor tired parent who's reading this to their child to try and get them to go to sleep. Like you're, you're giving them one rhythm and pattern and setting up. And as soon as they hit that second stanza, it's like they have to stop and they have to readjust to the new rhythm and the new meter and they're probably going to stumble over that. So um, I would either make the first stanza match the pattern of the rest or I would make it so different that it's obviously an introduction that that is going to be separate to frame the rest of the poem. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you're going to use it as a frame, you probably want something at the end that has that alternate um, rhythm and meter. So I would I would watch for that and rhythm and meter are really important. If you're going to use like slant rhymes, you need to stick with that. If you're going to use exact rhymes, you need to stick with that just because again, um, you set up the pattern and then when you break it, unless you're deliberately breaking it for a humorous effect or a dramatic effect, um, it feels like you've made a mistake, even if you did it on purpose um, to the reader. Um, one thing that really stood out for me in terms of um, the different refrains throughout this poem, such a, a fuss for shoes. Um, the rest of the poem is, is written in a really childlike voice and very enthusiastic and very youthful. And then such a fuss for shoes sounds like something mom would say, but it's presented as if it's the child thinking it. Um, and I think also it's a form of telling that's actually redundant because if it's about the, the child's excitement, um, such a such for such a sorry, such a fuss for shoes, <laughs> if that's expressing how excited the child is that there's a, a lunge, a lunging lizard coming up next, um, it needs to be in the child's voice, but we're already seeing that excitement. So it's like redundant. It's and if it's the mom's concern for keeping the shoes nice, if that's really something the mom is saying and I'm and it's just being presented in a way that's not clear that it's mom. Um, it, it repeats, don't scratch, don't scuff, don't muss, but in a less interesting way. Mm -hmm. So either way, whether it represents the child or the mom, I would actually cut that line completely and either replace it with something that really is the child's reaction to mom saying, hey, be careful of your shoes, um, or, or something that shows the child's enthusiasm in a way that isn't redundant. Um, when we get down to, and this is actually going to go on to the next slide. Um, when we get down to my hero steps are swift, and then my rocket steps are swift. And again, this is about pattern, setting up the pattern. None of the other ones are the same, but this one repeats. So I would replace the hero steps with something else that is heroic, like brave or strong, um, just so that they're either all different 
or you could make them all the same, but that wouldn't really make sense for, for what you're trying to do here. Um, also, there's another problem with repetition here. None of the last lines rhyme except for eek, a sneaky squeak, and g, a speeding streak. So I would, again, look at those two and say, since the rest of them don't rhyme, how can I break that, that repetition of rhyme with those particular final lines? Um, and the last thing was, well, actually, there was two things, and I would love your thoughts on both of them, Laura. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is, whoa, a flying fowl. And I'm not sure the wording of this made me think maybe it's not US English, maybe it's British or Australian or New Zealand. Um, just because of the way they use don't must. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm not sure, but I kind of wasn't sure if like a U.S. child would know the word foul, but maybe that's something that a British child actually would or an Australian child. So I just don't know if that's an age appropriate word mm -hmm. um, for the audience that's intended, which of course I don't know that either. <laughs> um, and the second thing was the line, oh no, a muddied mess. That breaks the pattern too, because up until now, that last line of the stanza has been the child's reaction mm -hmm. um, to the monsters. Mm -hmm. But then when we're reading about eagle steps, there's nothing in there that shows me why all of a sudden they've been taken out of that spell of imagination and suddenly are paying attention to their shoes being messy. Right. And I would almost feel like we need a second stanza in there after the eagles that shows something happening that makes the child aware that suddenly that they have made a mess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, I agree completely. Um, is that, do you have anything to add before I jump in? Um, the, like the... Yeah, the only other thing I'd add is like, I just, I love the idea and I love the use of language in general. And like, I really just think the awareness of the patterns that you're setting up with meter and rhyme and rhythm um, mm -hmm. Just making sure that you're being consistent with that as you're doing it. Um, if you interrupt it, do it deliberately to show a change in the action. Don't let it happen. Don't let mm -hmm. it happen otherwise. <laughs> right, right. No, I, I, I agree with all of your uh, comments. I, I, I also think this, I, I love the premise here. I love where this, this story is going. I agree with the, um, uh, the a flying foul. That one also... It, it felt, it, it, that's not a childlike phrase, you know. I, we're, I'm assuming that the protagonist here is probably somewhere between four and six years old, uh, you know, at, at least in the author's mind. And so that is not a phrase that, at least like you said, US kids would be using. I don't know if the author is British or if, you know, if that's a, a phrase there, but that's a good question to be asking. And I also, that a muddied mess at the end, it's different. It's suddenly the child is aware that, I'm just going to call it she, I can't remember if it's a boy or girl or if it was ever referred to, um, that she's made a mess of her shoes. And that such a fuss for shoes, I agree, that didn't fit for me either. And to me, what I would love to see is a line there where the child in each verse sort of resolves to take care of her shoes. You know, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna keep my shoes nice or whatever. And then, whoa, a speeding streak or, you know, uh, I'm gonna keep my shoe, oops, sorry. I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna go back to this other, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna keep my shoes nice. <gasps> Here comes a T-Rex, you know, so you could, you see the child like really trying, but, oh my gosh, it's so much fun to go step in this puddle or do this with the shoes. And then the illustrator can fill in what mom's doing in the pictures. We can see mom, you know, maybe first laugh and then start to get a little annoyed. And then, then we get down to, oh, sorry, I'm having such trouble with my, oh, sorry. Again, John's, I'm working on John's computer then we this this last line mom sees me slip she bites her lip I would almost rather just have that happen in the illustrations and so the whole story is in the child's first person viewpoint and they're so wrapped up in their imagination and then suddenly they slip and what is it about this slipping that pulls the child out of her game 
And, you know, maybe she slips and ends up in a mud puddle and then she realizes I've gone too far. <laughs> and then she has to somehow fix it. I, I, it just depends on where the story's going. And so that's one of those um, edits that you really need to see the entire plot to know if it's moving in the right direction. Because my only other sort of semi worry here is that we've got several verses that are kind of doing the same thing. And I'm wondering where it's going. Is it, is it, is the child going to end up somehow cleaning off her shoes at the end and being okay? Or is mom just going to be like, oh, well, now you have dinosaur shoes. I don't know <laughs> where this is going. And so I'd be curious about that. Um, but that's, that's, so it's hard for, for us to critique that part of it without seeing the whole thing. But I, I, I agree with everything that you said, Bonnie. Um, and I don't think the art directions are necessary. There were, let's see if I can make it go the right way here. These art notes at the beginning here. I don't think those are necessary. I think that a lot of that's implied from the text and you want to let the illustrator figure this out on their own because they might come up with an even better idea than what you did as the writer for that particular detail. And so, um, and to me, if I'm an editor reading this, those art notes just totally distract me. And I, and I don't wanna see them on the page. And I know a lot of editors take art notes out before they send it to the illustrator anyway, because they want the illustrator to have completely free reign to imagine the pictures. So um, that was my input on that. Okay. Now we have another middle grade here. Swifty Malone arrived at the animal shelter for his first day of community service. He signed his name on the sheet, on the sign-in sheet, shoved his hands in his pants pocket and walked into the back. He could hear all the dogs barking as they leaned against the wall. Hey, you, said a deep voice. No slacking off here. Help yourself to the shovels. This is no picnic. Lots of work here. Screw you, Swifty mumbled under his breath. Here you go, said the tall, skinny guy, hiding behind the sunglasses. Swifty took the roll of trash bags and shoved them in his pocket. He stopped to look at each of the dogs as he swept out the stalls. He had always wanted a dog, and the answer was always no. He continued on until the blonde guy spoke. It's 9.15, time to walk the dogs now. Finish that up. I just got started, replied Swifty. Too bad, time to move on, follow me. Swifty did as he was told. He shuffled his feet noisily behind. What kind of a name is Swifty anyway, said the guy, pushing long strands of hair from his face. Not really any of your business, is it? Just here to do my time. Oh my, you'll need to lose that anger real quick, pal. No place for it here. But Swifty wasn't listening. He was putting the leash on a German shepherd dog whose name was Jack. Hi there, said Swifty. You ready to go? I thought this was really interesting. And it feels very 1920s gangster to me mm. because of the language. Um, mm. And it has like a little bit of that noir feeling. Um, I wasn't sure if this is meant to be an historical, but I'm assuming that that was the intention. Um, I really love the idea of this tough guy uh, having his life changed by the dog he's going to be taking care of. Um, I'm assuming this is the middle of the story that we're coming in. And I have no idea how old Swifty is. I have, I mean, he talks like an adult. Um, I'm assuming because it's a middle grade book that he would be probably a teenager or a, a preteen maybe. But mm -hmm. then also maybe this is historical and this is about like a famous a famous person who I've just never heard of. So it's a little bit hard to tell that way how old Swifty is. I'm going to assume he's a teenager for the sake of reading this, um, just because also his parents are letting him do community service on his own, and mm -hmm. there doesn't seem to be a lot of supervision. Um, so I think um, the biggest thing that jumped out at me is um, uh, on, this, on this at first was that the, there's only two people in the scene, but the second person is described differently every single time. 
in science fiction, we call that burly detective syndrome, <laughs> where like mm -hmm. the author doesn't want to use the character's name over and over. They're worried about repetition. So instead they call them the burly detective said, the red haired man said, the tall man said, and this, this kind of thing happened here. He's the deep voice. And there doesn't seem to be a reason to hide his identity. He's not an actual disembodied voice coming in over a speaker. He's he's there. And then he's the blonde guy. And then he's the tall, skinny guy hiding behind the sunglasses. Um, and then he's the guy pushing strands of hair back from his face. And I feel like the author was really trying to describe the character without describing the character. <laughs> um, one of the ways that they handle this in noir fiction is that the protagonist gives the unnamed character a nickname. Whereas like he's blonde, so like Swifty starts calling him Blondie in, in his own head as, as we're going through the story. Um, but another way to do it is actually just have him give his name. <laughs> um, and that would be fine too. Um, the other big thing that jumps out at me with this is that, well, actually two more big things. The first one is we don't get any interior monologue at all. We have no thoughts and feelings at all from Swifty. Um, and there's opportunities for that. And um, that's something we talk about a lot in Fix 23 on with character reactions is like there are moments in this scene where Swifty is having emotions. Like for example, when he thinks about how he always wanted a dog and the answer was always no. Um, there's no reason why that couldn't be expanded into either a reaction to being told no that he can't have a dog um, or like actually a very, very short flashback where we actually see him remembering asking his dad for a dog um, when he saw a cute one on the street that was like obviously hungry, but dad said no, right? Or something that actually gives us a little more insight into what's going on under Swifty's tough guy exterior. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, after he's being told to finish up and move on, he could be annoyed, right? Or he could be like, what the heck is going on here? I'm, I'm not even finishing one job before they give me another job, right? And, and that's another opportunity for him to have an emotion. I have no idea how he feels about community service other than he feels obligated to be defiant externally. <laughs> um, or he could have a reaction to, um, and this is probably the one I would go with. Um, I wouldn't do all three. I would pick one or, or come up with your own. But the one I would probably do is when he's sweeping out the stalls, he's looking at multiple dogs. And that's a really fantastic opportunity to show us something about him because you can show us which of the dogs he's drawn to, like which dog does he have sympathy for? Or which dog does he identify with and think that dog is just like me? Or which dog does he feel sorry for? And like, does he pity or look down on, right? I mean, that's, that's an opportunity not just to get a cute dog in there, and foreshadow that the dogs are going to change him, but also to hint that he has this desire for emotional connection and that he is not just feeling very screwed you to the rest of the world. He actually does have feelings about all the beings that he's encountering, even if we only get to see what he feels about the dogs. Um, and the second, the, the second big thing is I would, there's like no sensory detail in here at all. It's like the, I don't know what the shelter looks like other than that it has stalls and there's shovels. I don't know what it smells like. Um, we talk about the dogs barking, um, but that could be described in a way that kind of implies what's going on with the dogs. Like, are they barking because they're all excited? Are they barking because there's been a disturbance? Does it sound like they're all barking at somebody who just came in? Like that's another opportunity to, to put a little um, emotional atmosphere in, in terms of what the shelter is like that he's walking into. Um, and, and, um, in terms of, uh, the screw you line, actually, Laura, I was really interested in your opinion because I, I wouldn't have thought that middle grade would have, would, it would be okay to, mm -hmm. to say that. I didn't know. So that's something that like, I was just not sure about. <laughs> yeah. Um, and actually this might be, uh, intended to be YA. I don't believe the author, uh, you know, told me what age group it was. And I think I just, in my head, it was upper middle grade, that sort of 10 to 14. But depending on how old Swifty is, it could totally go YA and it, and it would just depend. I think the scene after this is very important uh, to establish a lot more about this character. What is he doing community service for? 
um, you you want to imply his age in some way, um, whether it's the grade he is in school or you know uh, the uh, supervisor at the animal shelter saying, you know, we have to get your parents to sign off on this because you're under 16. I mean, you could come, you could do a lot with, with the age, but basically if, if the character, if Swifty is like 14 or younger, it's probably upper middle grade. If he's 15 or older, it's going to be YA. 14 is sort of a weird age for characters. It could go YA or middle grade. It just depends on what happens in the story. Um, but most of the time, 14 year old characters are going to be that upper middle grade, which is sort of 10 to 14 is what is the, the age designation given on the, the book. So again, it depends what happens, but as far as screw you, yes, that is a totally that upper middle grade. Absolutely. A character could say that, uh, you wouldn't, you probably wouldn't want out and out profanity, but absolutely, especially if Swifty is not happy about being there, uh, he would certainly, and a, and, a, and a 13 or 14 year old would certainly use that language in real life <laughs> if they're mad at someone. So yes, I think that's, that's fine for, for that upper middle grade. Um, so yeah, if the author is here listening, uh, I acknowledge, we acknowledge this could be YA if that's what you intend, but I think it would need, I think if this is YA, that next scene is especially important because you've really got to up the stakes here and put something in there that's going to keep readers who are 14, 15, 16 years old riveted on this story. And so, um, you know, we have to learn more about Swifty's background and, and, and sort of what's the bigger issue here uh, that, that why he's here. And it's going to have to be relevant to those high school kids versus middle school kids, if, if YA is the way you want to go with this. But I, I agree. I think it has that a really cool tone. Uh, the, his name, Swifty, kind of gives me a sense of possible time period. But again, you'd want more details pretty quick. Um, and, and sort of the, the tone of the, the whole book. Um, so it's, it's very intriguing. I think there's a lot of potential here with this one. All right, picture book biography. And I think this is a two page, two slide one as well. Okay, each evening before bed, Billy spins, spins, spins like a top to songs his father finds on the radio. When his aunt tells him he could study tap dancing, Billy begs his parents, please, can I take lessons? They refuse, asking, why can't you be more like the other boys? Billy spins, spins, spins his tears away. When he isn't dancing, Billy dreams of dancing. He hears rhythms all around him. The tick-tock of a clock, the drip, drop, drip of rain, the whir, whip, whir, whip, whir of windshield wipers. Rhythms fill his head and pulse through his feet. He performs, uninvited, when the relatives visit often with marbles in his toes, tappity tap tap, and continues pestering his parents for lessons. Finally, oops, gotta move this. When he turns eight and a half, Billy's father tells him, you can take tap dancing lessons if I can find a male teacher, and if there are other boys in the class, and if you take piano lessons. Billy's heart skips a beat. His father enrolls him and his sister at the Purrington Academy of Dance Art. Mr. Purrington is a retired tap dancer and legally blind. He picks up Billy's feet and moves them around to teach different steps. During the first class, Billy learns brush front, brush back, step, brush front, brush back, hop, step. Billy hears a world of possibilities in the steps, rhythms, and music. Okay, do you want me to go back to the first slide? Um, yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. Okay. Um, I really love this one too. I think this is um, this is the use of language in this is really fantastic, especially to create rhythms and a sense of motion. Um, it feels very active. I love tick tock of a clock, drip drop, drip of rain, whip whir, whip whir, windshields, and spin, spin, spins. Like the the use of language here to create a sense of motion is just beautiful. 
Um, there's lots of powerful verbs. It's free meter, so you don't have to worry about the rhyme or the rhythm. Um, you just need to make sure that the sentences read really smoothly. Um, and there's lots of auditory uh, sensory details. So it, the, the rhythms are really emphasized by the auditory details. Um, I don't have a ton of feedback except for the last line. And I feel like the last line really drops us out of the spell that the entire rest of the passage does. If we could go to the, the second slide. Um, the last line is, um, mm. Billy hears a world of possibilities in the steps, rhythms, and music. Um, and this last line is very abstract. <laughs> it doesn't convey any emotion after you've built up all this excitement around dancing. Um, Billy's finally getting a chance to live his dream. He's getting to do the thing that he has wanted to do that his father was very reluctant to let him do. Um, I almost want, I, I want him to do something that actually shows that excitement and that joy of having discovered mm -hmm. Like, uh, like, does he spin, spin, spin with joy when the lesson is done? Or is there some other thing that you can do to keep up that sense of kinetic, um, that kinetic sense of like feeling what's happening in Billy as this whole thing goes through? Because I feel like I'm in him. I'm feeling the spinning and the tapping and the worrying. And then at the end, it just kind of drops into this very, it's almost like we pulled back out of Billy to like make a judgment about how he's having this experience instead of staying in Billy and showing us like what that joy of like discovering mm -hmm. your dream really, really feels like. So that's actually the main thing I would do. Like I would look at it like, does he do something? Um, does learning these make him want to do something? Um, is he imagining himself up on stage dancing? Is he wishing that he could live with Mr. Purrington and do this like from morning until bedtime. It's like, like what is Billy's experience now that he's done this? And I'd like that last line to just really put me in that like sense of joy. And that's really my only feedback. Well, I have a minor feedback. There's a few words in here that feel a little bit adult, like pestering and uninvited compared to the rest of the passage. Um, I'm not sure about the age group since this is a biography if maybe it's older kids. So maybe that's fine. I don't really have a, a sense there in terms of, of those words. Um, but I really just want the emotion to hit me hard at the end after you've built me up so much. Right. And yes, uh, nonfiction picture books, especially biographies, tend to have a broader audience. Eight, they might go up to age 10, sometimes even 12, depending on the topic. So vocabulary is not, you know, a word like pestered. It's a cool word to read and to hear. Uh, and, and so I personally think it's fine, but it's good to sort of be aware of, of all of those word choices. I agree with it, with everything Bonnie said. And as far as this last line, what, what I love, um, is the rhythm and the, the rhythm gradually becomes a rhythm of, of the tap dance in the, in the text. And you've got the sounds here starting, you know, the spin, 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 the tippity tap, but I love this, the tick tock of a clock, the drip, drop, drip, the whip were, whip were, which is hard to say out loud, but it's cool. Um, and okay stop that. Um, I don't know why I did that. So here, he hears a world of possibilities. I wanted you to bring back sounds like that, like you did on the previous page, but the possibilities. So what does possibility sound like to him? You say he hears a world of possibilities. So incorporate though that rhythm in the text uh, into that joy and that possibility, as Bonnie was saying, and I think that would be great to to keep this this uh, this rhythm that is uh, making us think of tap dancing in, in with the words as you go along in the story. And the only other feedback I had was this first paragraph has some really long sentences, and the rest of the manuscript the sentences are pretty compact. And so I felt that that first paragraph, those first two sentences especially, 
try to find a way to make those shorter or to break them into shorter sentences so they have more, more of a rhythm to them and you don't have these long sentences before we get into the tighter uh, sentences that really start to echo the tap dance. Um, and that's, that's all I had to say, but I, I think this is a very, very strong draft as well and a great topic. So, okay. All right, so this one I guessed, again on the age group, that it's either a chapter book. Chapter books typically are for ages seven to 10. That's the classic chapter book age. We do have young chapter books for six to nine, but I would see this as either a seven to 10 chapter book or young middle grade, which is that sort of eight to 11. There's often a lot of crossover in the audience and the writing style between those two uh, age groups, depending on it's really dependent on how long the story ends up being, whether it's going to be a chapter book or a middle grade novel. But that's what I saw this as. Okay. Squawking in terror, she wrenched free. Most of her tail feathers were lost in Fox's mouth. Those snapping jaws wouldn't miss next time. Cow pens up ahead. Seeds swerved above the food trough and into the pen. She kept her left eye focused on the far door as she dashed between cow legs. Angry cows bellowed and stamped, but she made it through the open door. The confusion in the pen should slow Fox. A glance around showed nowhere to hide. Her only choice was to keep running. Loose feathers fluttered to the ground behind her, leaving a trail. He'd find her. She flapped her wings as she ran downhill through the potato field. The burning pain of ripped out feathers pushed her on as she gasped for air. Off to the side, a pile of cut logs rose high above her. She climbed the hill of tree trunks and crouched, trembling at the top. There was no time for a plan. Fox stood at the bottom of the hill, staring up at her. Desperate, seed pushed on a piece of wood. It didn't budge with her measly nudge. Fox started up the hill and logs rocked beneath his feet. She watched as he staggered, then found safe footing. If she didn't think of something fast, she was a goner. An idea as crazy as a flying stag beetle zoomed to mind. She couldn't stay here. Attacking was her only chance. Wings flapping, she launched herself straight at Fox. Um, this is another really great passage. Um, I really enjoyed reading it. Like again, lots of powerful verbs, like verbs are so important. Um, and this passage feels very dynamic. We have a um, great pacing, the action really flies. Um, again, it feels like we're starting in the middle of the story, um, maybe even in the middle of a scene. Um, there were, I had a little bit of trouble visualizing some things. For example, like cow pens up ahead, and then she dashed between cow legs, which read a little bit awkwardly. Um, I would have expanded that a little and maybe tried to be a little more descriptive with, like maybe she's dashing between a maze of cow legs or she's dashing between one cow's legs and then around another or something to just give the reader like a little more visual of exactly what the action is there. Um, and then again with the, um, she's running through the potato field, but then she sees a pile off to the side and then she's climbing the hill of tree trunks and it actually stopped there and had to go back and go like, oh, the trial, the hill of tree trunks is the pile of cut logs. Um, just because I think of logs as, I mean, I used to chop wood, I grew up on a farm. <laughs> so I was thinking of branches and, and chopped up uh, logs as opposed to full tree trunks. Um, so just, just language wise switching like that, just know that that is something that might catch people who are trying to keep the, the visuals. And I don't know if there will be pictures with this. So maybe the visuals won't be as important, um, but just like calling it a wood pile instead of a hill of tree trunks um, or starting out and calling it tree trunks at the beginning so that we know that that's what it looks like to the hen. They just like seem so massive, um, but being consistent with that imagery. Um, the other two things that stepped out was, um, well, the big one was the, an idea as crazy as a flying stag beetle zoomed to mind. I snagged on that too, because up until now, we've had very simple sentences that are very straightforward. They're very focused on action. I don't know what a stag beetle is. I mean, I've seen lots of different beetles, but like I had to stop and think, does a stag beetle have wings? Is that why it's crazy? Or are, are stag beetles crazy? Like, I'm not sure. It, I had to think about it instead of staying immersed in the action. Um, and also it, 
it doesn't really, I don't think you need it. It's like a confusing metaphor. And we still want to be like deep in the adrenaline rush here where she's deciding she has to attack. So um, I think this is one of those darlings that needs to be killed. It's like a great metaphor maybe, but I wouldn't put it in the middle of an action sequence. And I would make sure that that I was doing it in a context where a reader had already seen a stag beetle so that we know that they don't fly. And maybe this is looks like it's coming from the middle of something. So maybe that was already done and that's been set up. Um, and that's, I was just confused because I didn't read the first part, but right. um, I still, I still wouldn't put it in an action scene. I'd put it somewhere else. <laughs> mm -hmm. And also you could kind of, you could kind of, um, uh, instead of having the idea and the metaphor, you could actually show what the fox is doing that makes her decide that attacking is her only chance instead of just telling her she got the idea and then telling us she couldn't stay there. Um, and that would again, be replacing the metaphor with some action that we could still visualize. Um, but overall, this is like really well done. Like I was really zooming along as I was reading it. I'm feeling seeds fear. Um, actually, probably again, because I'm coming in the middle. Initially, I stopped on seed swerved because I didn't realize that was her name. <laughs> um, just because we didn't start the passage with it. But that's like a function of being in the middle of the scene. Sure. Um, and overall, it was I was really, really, I love the flow in this. It just really zooms. Mm -hmm. I agree. And I think uh, I also, the word seed the first time kind of pulled me up, but then I realized it was her name. And so again, but we're coming in at the middle. I would have liked to have seen her name used a little more often in place of the pronoun she sort of toward the middle of this passage, just because to remind me this was her name because then it popped up again and it's an, an unusual name. And so um, to see it a little more often, but again, we're coming in in the middle. So take that with a grain of salt. I agree with that one sentence and idea as crazy as a flying stag beetle. It also, it's sort of an omniscient viewpoint that that sentence, it's like it's judging the idea and it's almost like it's not coming from inside her head um, or she's, she's stopping to comment on her own idea. And you're right, this would not happen at this moment. I think it can, but it also, I totally believed this was a hen up until that line. And I'm like, would a hen actually think that? An idea is crazy as a flying stag beetle. And, and until that moment, I was totally like, oh yes, this is a hen. She's being hunted by a fox. She's terrified. She's trying to get away. I totally believed it. So I agree. That's one of those darlings that probably has to go. <laughs> uh, that's the kind of that's an idea as crazy as a flying stag beetle could be in dialogue at some point. And, you know, another character might say that to her and that would show personality. If you love the phrase, you might work it in that way somehow. Um, but yeah, I think this is great. And, and I hope I guessed right on either that chapter book or early middle grade, because it just felt like that to me uh, with the animal characters. And it's such a tight action scene. Um, that's that's the age group that I kind of saw this as. So if you are intending this as something other than that, that could be a problem. <laughs> uh, if you're thinking this is young adult, probably not. If you're thinking this is a picture book, no, this, this reads like a novel to me, a short novel of some sort. Uh, and Bonnie, would you agree on that? That the pacing and everything is very novel-like. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Okay, great, but great. And I love, this is a very original story. Like I'm, I'm, I like, these characters are intriguing. I'm curious as to what's happening. Uh, so I, I like that. Okay, uh, so this is our last one. This is from a middle grade biographical collection. And I did put that in here because the author did tell me that. I think it's important. My impression, you know, my assumption is that this collection is going to have short biographies uh, around some sort of theme here. Okay. 
Ethel Smythe was such a force of nature, a family member described her as a pocket Niagara after the powerful waterfall. Even though women composers were rare in the 19th century, in 19th century England, she had the drive to become a composer from a young age. At age 12, Ethel discovered classical music from a governess who'd studied music in Germany. It was a revelation. She later wrote that it opened up a new world to her. She wanted study at the same music school, but her father disapproved. He thought artists were immortal, immoral. <laughs> Plus, he worried it might ruin her marriage prospects. Not exactly father of the year material, but in those days, parents wanted daughters to marry well so the husband could provide for her. Ethel knew what she wanted and how to push her parents' buttons. The 19-year-old defied them by not going to church, refusing to sing at dinner parties, and not speaking to anyone until they let her go to Germany. Score one for Ethel. In Germany, Ethel met famous composers, including Tchaikovsky and Brahms. They praised her talents. Still, Brahms didn't believe a woman had written her music. In her struggle to be taken seriously, she traveled to Paris to try to persuade the manager of, of the prestigious Metropolitan Opera to give her a chance. He did. In 1903, at the age of 44, she became the first female composer to have her work produced by the Met. I really enjoyed this. I knew nothing about Ethel, Dame Ethel, before I read it. Um, she sounded like a fascinating person. I think the person who did this did a really great job of picking out really key facts and kind of weaving them into a narrative that shows the course of her career. So I was very impressed with that, even though it's only a few paragraphs. I feel like I got an overview of what was really important about her, um, her career and her life. Um, the major comment I have is a tone issue <laughs> because we alternate between like very formal textbook language and comments like score one for Ethel and not exactly father of the year material. And it almost feels a little schizophrenic in tone. I get what you're, what you're doing here. You're like trying to have like the serious information, but also kind of make it engaging by having the, the contemporary commentary, which I like the idea. I almost feel like maybe you want to make it even a little more distinct, like maybe put all of the, the modern sensibility comments in parentheses so we can see that it's you, the narrator, chiming in and giving us little, little notes on what's going on with Ethel. Um, or I would lighten it up and I would make the whole thing very casual so that it's very clearly a modern narrator. It's like, hey, I'm just giving you the the deets on Ethel and what was going on with her and, and just kind of trying to have that tone be consistent all the way through. Um, and either way, I think you're going to get some humor out of it. But the way it is now where it's a little bit mushed together, the formal and the informal, it just feels really uneven. And you, I think you're actually losing humor potential by doing it that way. Mm -hmm. So that's my main comment. Yeah, I completely agree uh, that that tone needs to be consistent. And I I also prefer the, the more informal uh, one, but it, it depends on the market for this. This could, you know, if you're writing this for an educational publisher, for example, they might have very specific uh, guidelines as to what their the tone needs to be, and they might want it more straightforward, informational. So, it, you know, think about who your market is going to be for this. Uh, what publishers you're going to be targeting with this collection, and that will help you decide which tone you're going to use. Uh, the other great thing that you can do, uh, for example, if you have that more sort of informal tone, but you want to have more straightforward information, consider including sidebar material uh, that could be put in, in a box uh, on the page or on a facing page that has just more sort of straightforward facts or a timeline about her life, uh, that's a good way to get that sort of information in while still keeping the lighter, more interesting tone to the rest of the text. Um, but great, this is, this is a very strong, strong excerpt, I thought. Okay, 
Well, we're going to take a few minutes for some questions here. Bonnie, thank you for, this has been a long social for us. Normally we're, we get done in an hour. So I appreciate your time, Bonnie. And I appreciate those of you who are still hanging out with us uh, for sticking with us. And we'll get to these few questions. I wanted, before we do, before I stop sharing my screen, I wanted to just uh, show you the slide one more time. And Manuscript Magic is our writing blueprint that Bonnie is the instructor of where she takes you through those three levels of editing, story, scene, and sentence. And there are diagnostic questionnaires where you can answer very specific questions about your work in progress that point you to very specific solutions. So if you go to writingblueprints.com and click on the uh, manuscript magic picture, uh, you'll see uh, an explanation of that, but this is a very unique blueprint for us. So uh, dog days 21 is the uh, code to save 30% on that until through Saturday. So go check that out. And now I'm going to stop sharing so we can see Bonnie better. And I'm going to look at uh, uh, some questions here. Um, how do you indicate something is an introduction versus part of the rhythm of the story? How would you have changed the introduction of this? Oh, the rhyming picture book. I'm trying to remember the, um, uh, oh, that was the one about the shoes, I believe, Bonnie, where you said the beginning uh, should either stand alone as a completely different pattern or match the pattern that's in the rest of the verses. Um, so how would you indicate something as an introduction? Well, it's not really an introduction. It's the, it's not like an introduction as, as, as you would do in a novel where you have, you know, an introduction or a, or a nonfiction book. It's just the opening verse really is what we're saying. But, um, if, if you're, if it's not going to match the rest of the verses, it still has to have uh, an appealing rhythm to it, right? Um, that that draws the reader in. I mean, my personal preference in that situation would be to try to match the rhythm of the rest of the verses because you are setting the pattern for the person who's reading it out loud, probably an adult. And to force them to change the pattern after the first verse, they're gonna lose momentum and energy. And a really important part of reading picture books out loud is that energy and think about the teacher who's reading it out loud to a kindergarten class, say, you know, or a preschool class. And if suddenly after that first verse, the energy shifts, you're losing a lot of your kids there. Their attention's going to start wandering. So my preference would be to try to match the rhythm of the rest of the manuscript with that first verse. How do you feel about that, Bonnie? I feel the same way. Um, like personally, I would I would make it match just because it's it's simpler. And mm -hmm. again, if you're going to make it really different, the opening stanza, then you need to make sure there's a an ending stanza that frames it at the end, so that it's very clear right. that those two very different things are bookends as opposed to mm -hmm. the poem just changing. <laughs> yes, exactly. And. Um, yes, exactly. So if it is a different rhythm, there should be. They, they should bookend the poem and it should still set up the rest of the of the uh, rhyme. So for example, if the rest of the rhyme has a lot of short lines, that opening verse, even if it's a different uh, rhyming scheme or, or meter, should still have short lines, you know, so that again, the expectation of the person reading it out loud is, I'm going to be reading a lot of short lines here. And they don't have to switch after the first verse because they will they will stumble <laughs> and you don't want that to happen. OK, what are some common mistakes with internal dialogue? That's a good question. That is a really good question. Um, one of the biggest mistakes I see a lot is people having the character think something that then repeats exactly like we saw in in that one of those excerpts. The character thinks something and then they say it out loud <laughs> and and that, that repetition you lose the reader because they just saw that same idea in the thought um whereas like the really the best use for internal 
um, monologue is to highlight something that is not happening outside the character. So like something that nobody but the reader gets to know um, about what the character is feeling or thinking. So interior monologue, when it's done well, it often contrasts with what the character is doing outside. It shows something the character is hiding or it shows that the character is feeling ambiguous about it. So we see what they say, but then we also see that what they think is, is not the same. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's the number one mistake. And the number two mistake is having interior monologue where the character just says something really obvious. Um, like if, if your reader, if everyone reading the story would be thinking the exact same thing, don't have the character think it because the reader is already thinking it. Like mm -hmm. save, save those moments because interior monologue slows the prose down. So save those moments where you're slowing things down for something that's really different and unexpected that the care that the reader doesn't already know the character is thinking or feeling. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. Thank you. So Melba's is saying many manuscripts I beta read do not have a gender or name of the character until after several scenes or chapters have happened. What suggestions do you have on this? And I'm curious, I'm sure it depends on whether the it's written in first person or third person. Um, so what do you think about that, Bonnie? Um, well, I'm assuming that you mean it's unintentional, <laughs> that the <laughs> author isn't actually deliberately hiding like they do in murder mysteries where you don't know if a character is male or female because mm -hmm. they're a suspect. <laughs> right, right. Um, but if it's unintentional, I do think it's really, really important to find a way to bring that in. Um, and it could be as simple as having, like if your character is female and you're writing in first person, it could be as simple as having a minor secondary character say, hey girl, or something that just indicates the gender without flat out telling you, oh, and by the way, I'm a woman as I'm telling you what's happening to right. me. Um, or having there be a character action where like the character, um, and, and again, like this isn't always, always accurate because men carry purses too but right and you can have the character pick up a purse or you could have her do something that suggests gender but it's not 100 there so mm -hmm. i also think though that when you have a manuscript you're beta reading you're not seeing the cover necessarily like the 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 reader should know the character's gender from the back cover blurb and the the cover when they buy mm -hmm. the book most right. of the time, unless there's been some sort of effort to hide that. And then again, mm -hmm. you think it would be intentional, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, true. And, and also, I think it's very important to keep in mind that if you're writing for the younger end of children, like like a easy reader chapter book, even middle grade, you don't want your readers to be confused early on. They're going to put the book down. Uh, they're not going to wade through four or five chapters to find out the name of the main character. <laughs> so you, you don't want to hide that from the reader unless there's a good reason for it. Like, like you said, Bonnie, if it's a murder mystery and your protagonist is the criminal, you know, or a mystery of some sort, and they don't want anybody to know who they are, they're trying to keep their identity secret. But then we're going to know that from the beginning that the protagonist is hiding the identity. So then we're going to start looking for clues to see, oh, maybe maybe this person's going to slip up, and I'm going to figure out who they are, um, and then it then it's interesting. But you don't want the reader to just be annoyed or confused. That's not a good thing. <laughs> okay, so Mindy asks, why not getting back to the uh, the rhyme about the shoes? Why not include different words such as foul? Uh, I think that's the one that had foul in it. I believe mm -hmm. uh, couldn't couldn't this be a teaching moment? And I think and and this was the problem certainly that, that I had with that was that this was written in the voice of the narrator uh, who was a young child and the young child wouldn't use that word. We think if it's an American anyway. Uh, so that was the issue there. If it was uh, a different type of narrator or a third person story or nonfiction, you could certainly use the word foul. It was just, it didn't sound authentic to the voice of the narrator. Do you have anything? No, I agree a hundred percent. It's mm -hmm. like a character voice issue. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Uh, 
uh, oh. <laughs> a couple of people have asked, Bonnie, do you do edits and critiques? Right now, I don't. I'm working exclusively with um, Sterling and Stone. Um, I do comment in the Manuscript Magic uh, uh, Facebook group. Like mm -hmm. if you post a short excerpt and you're like, I, I looked at this, I know that there's an issue with it, I don't know how to fix it, or I see that I could go both ways, you can post like a few hundred words, I'll look at it and, mm -hmm. and weigh in and Laura will weigh in. Um, there are some people who've been using the system for quite a while now too, and some of your classmates will weigh in and give you some, some good suggestions. Yes. Absolutely. And I must say, there's a comment here in the chat box from JT Brock, who's a manuscript magic customer, and says, manuscript magic is a very good resource. Bonnie is very knowledgeable and has totally revolutionized my editing. So it is awesome. But I do, Bonnie's, it comes with a private Facebook group, as do all our blueprints, and Bonnie's answers to questions are an education in and of themselves. She is very thorough, uh, which is awesome. And you do a whole extra bonus product that just goes through using Manuscript Magic for a picture book, which is also very, very interesting. So uh, she shows how to use this whole her whole editing techniques just on picture books, as well as novels and, and narrative, longer narrative nonfiction. So it's very thorough. Um, so, oh, this person asked about the name seed in that last, the excerpt with the, the hen and the fox. Will an editor suggest using a different name? Seed tripped me up too. Perhaps the name was deliberately unique and explained earlier. Um, and again, it, it's hard to judge that without seeing the, the story from the very beginning. Um, that she has this name, maybe there's a specific reason for it. Maybe that's her favorite food, maybe, you know, who knows? So um, I think if if it's clear from the beginning and it and it's it makes sense for the story, I don't think an editor will suggest changing it. Um, but I think it's picking names is is very tricky. Uh, do you have any do you have any suggestions for that body? Picking names for your characters, things to um, keep in mind. Yeah, things to keep in mind is that um, words have resonance like for example seed was a little confusing because it's not an animal name right it's like a it's like a in the plant world so so setting that up like you said laura right at the beginning and getting the reader used to it before we're in that really fast-paced thing where we're just having to follow the action can mm -hmm. make a difference um also thinking about um sound is important like sound can convey personality and i think actually seed um, does kind of have that, like the E's have that kind of perky, um, tenacious sound. So I actually kind of like it for the hen. Mm -hmm. I just, I just, because I didn't know from the beginning and the action is very, mm -hmm. very focused. Um, right. In the chat box here, Julie says seed is a small black hen. So it's a, it's a type of hen. So uh -huh. there's significance there. So now we learn something. Yeah. But yes, names are important. And the other, the other thing is, yeah, you don't want a lot of character names that sound alike in a book, especially in a picture book that's being read out loud. It is so hard to keep them straight <laughs> when you're hearing the story. So lots of things to consider when you're picking names. Yeah. Um, I'm just gonna do one more and then we'll let you go, Bonnie, because You've given us a lot of great time here, but I do want to, oh, Gabby asks, how did we get sample submissions for the session? So we, I sent out an email to all of our Children's Book Insider subscribers. So if you're a subscriber to CBI and you checked that you will receive emails from us when you set up your subscription, uh, you would have gotten an email. So we'll, we'll do this again down the road uh, if Bonnie's willing. And so I'll... I'll put out a call again. So just be sure to check your emails from us. Don't just ignore us and see you get good stuff happens to you. Um, okay. Uh, last one here. Uh, I'd appreciate your comments on the first two excerpts. They were used past tense. Mom was on the phone. Dad was fixing the chair. How do you feel about past tense versus present tense in stories? Um, I really feel like it depends on the story. 
Um, I don't know if there's a convention in picture books, um, but I just feel like is is immediate, but was is kind of transparent. Um, is is a little more intrusive because it's it's apparent that someone is telling you this is happening right now. Whereas when you say it was this, this happened, um, we're so used to hearing stories told in past tense that we just tune out the past tense. So if you have a story that benefits from that immediacy, is might be the right thing to do, especially if you have a great narrator voice. Mm -hmm. um, if your style is more transparent where it's an omniscient narrator or you're deep in the character's voice, and um, you want voice not to be intrusive, I would use past tense. Mm -hmm. I agree completely. And I think with uh, picture books, it could be either past or present. I've seen both. Uh, present tense, and remember you've got the illustrations there. So the story has to be unfolding before the reader's eyes in present tense. Past tense, you can, refer to stuff that happened last week, you know, present tense is, it's trickier. Uh, so just keep those things in mind. And remember, picture books are always meant to be listened to by the child as it's being read out loud. So if you have to use a lot of transitions to show passage of time, either in past or present tense, it might be confusing for the child to follow along if they're just hearing it. So just keep that in mind when you're choosing whatever tense you're using for a picture book, but certainly in novels, it could be either way. And what I love is when I'm reading a book in present tense and I don't even realize it's in present tense until I'm halfway through, because then the author's done it so well that I didn't notice, I just sensed this immediacy about the story. And it didn't even stand out to me until I, all of a sudden I went, oh my gosh, this has all been happening in present tense. That's a masterful writer, I think. <laughs> Every time I've had that happen to me where I didn't realize I was reading present tense, it's because the author had a fantastic character narrator. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, absolutely. Well, Bonnie, thank you so much for your time tonight. This has been amazing. We've gotten amazing uh you know, comments in the chat box here. And remember to look out for your replay and we will have all the links to everything below it. And uh, hope you join us again in, this is our last one for August. So the first Tuesday in September, we'll see you again at the Kidlit Distant, at Kidlit Social. Uh, so thank you so much, Bonnie, for your time tonight. Oh yeah, thanks for having me. This has just been a blast. Great, well, and check out Manuscript Magic see more of Bonnie's genius. <laughs> okay, we'll see y'all next time. Good night, everybody.